Now let's look at one of our case studies. Um, and here we're going to be talking about some of the properties we just described, um, our dissociation constants and Hill equations, um, and also talking about this type of fitting that you can have with ligands. So here we're going to be talking about the proteins called globins or globins. These are proteins like hemoglobin or myoglobin in particular, which we'll be focusing on a lot in this chapter. Here's a biological problem. Proteins in general don't have a side chain that likes oxygen. So how do we get oxygen around? Unfortunately, we can't just let oxygen go through the bloodstream all by itself willy nilly because it would make free radicals in solution and it would be quite poisonous. Oxygen obviously oxidizes things. Um, oxygen is quite toxic, in fact, to what we would call many biological systems if you just put pure oxygen on them. Um, we just happen to evolve in an oxygen rich world and we need oxygen to survive. So how do we get oxygen? How do we move and transport oxygen around a biological system? But without just letting it run rampant through the system, causing mass oxidation, causing destruction of cells, causing free radicals, et cetera. Well, again, there's a, pro there's a problem because proteins, which is what we usually use to transport things, don't have any type of site that binds oxygen well. So in the biological system, we've developed a way to utilize a molecule called heme. So I want to be clear here, heme is not the protein. Heme is a small molecule that has iron in it. And iron binds oxygen very well. The solution is that you utilize this oxygen binding molecule with iron in it, heme, within a protein. And this is exactly what these globins do. Myoglobin uses heme and it acts as a storage molecule for oxygen and hemoglobin utilizes heme and it acts as a transport molecule for oxygen. So here's what that looks like. Again, heme, this is just heme, is this small molecule you, it can be drawn like so, or here it is with all of the carbons and nitrogens, et cetera, written out in the structure that utilizes an iron in the center. So it's this ring type of molecule, heme. It's classified as what we call a porphyrin. Porphyrins all have this same base structure um, this is actually the base structure of a porphyrin and where those X's are, those X's can be slightly changed to be different molecules. Um, so for example, a methyl group on the end, an ethyl group on the end, it might have an alcohol group on the end. Depending on the slight changes of what those X's are, you get different porphyrins. Again, here in picture B is the exact structure of heme itself and those filled in areas. And here's a 3D representation of it. And this is color coded the atoms in the molecule to show you where the carbons are, the hydrogens, the red is of course um, oxygens and the blue is nitrogen. So you can see these four nitrogens in blue, which are also here, here and here, coordinate in this square planar structure and iron. So it's very flat. Heme is very flat and the iron just sits in the center. And that leaves space from the top and the bottom for this iron to be bound by other molecules, in this case, in particular, oxygen. So again, heme is this flat ring structure with iron in the center. 
that is then utilized inside of a protein. So here's what it looks like. Here's the structure of myoglobin, for example. This is just a cartoon structure, but you can see these cartoon um, cylinders just represent part of the protein. Remember, the secondary structure of protein can be represented in this cartoon nature as helixes um, or beta sheets. So these cylinders are just representing some type of secondary structure, but this whole thing is the protein. We're not showing all the individual amino acids, it's a large protein. And inside of the protein, some histidine amino acids are actually coordinating and helping to stabilize a heme molecule. So this whole thing is what we call myoglobin, but myoglobin again is a protein that utilizes a small molecule heme within it to help it function. So here's a kind of a close up of where the heme molecule is in the myoglobin. Here's one of the histine residues. And you can see it binds the iron on one of those other sides. Remember, heme is very flat, as we showed here. It has ability, it has open areas on the top and bottom. So one of those sides is bound by a histidine. And that leaves the other side, so just one side that is open and available for oxygen to bind the iron. Now, when oxygen binds to hemoglobin or myoglobin, these both are proteins that have very similar types of structure, and I will show you hemoglobin later, but just know that hemoglobin has very similar basic um, outline as our myoglobin here. When oxygen binds to heme, it actually changes its color, its absorbance. So heme is a very strong chromophore, meaning that it's a molecule that has a absorbance that is in the visible range. And actually it has an absorbance in both the ultraviolet and visible range. Um, because there is some in the visible range, we can see the color because of heme. So it is heme, it's the iron bound heme within hemoglobin and within myoglobin that actually give, for example, blood its color. Just that heme ring, heme is the, the part of it that is very colorful. So actually the rest of this whole protein, the rest, all the amino acids, they're not colorful. <laughs> it's just that heme molecule and it gives the whole molecule color. Now, when heme binds oxygen, it actually has a change in its color. So we can see this in spectroscopy. When oxygen binds heme, it shifts the position of its essentially absorbance band from this 429 to 414, 414 nanometers. And again, you can monitor that with spectroscopy, you can watch um, how much of a molecule with heme in it is bound to oxygen. So if you wanna think about, for example, these plots up here, the Hill equations, we talked about the fraction of enzyme that is bound. Well, how do we tell when half of this myoglobin protein is bound? Well, we can use spectroscopy to look at when half of the heme color has changed, essentially. So again, we can, we can monitor how much oxygen is bound to a heme molecule in myoglobin or hemoglobin using UV spectroscopy. In real life, in reality, this also can be visible in, for example, your veins and your blood because hemoglobin, myoglobin are in our blood cells. We can see that um, when hemoglobin, for example, does not have oxygen, it appears purplish in color. And when it does have oxygen, when it is bound to oxygen, it instead appears reddish in color. 
And again, this is all because of that shift in this SORE band, this absorbance band, when heme, just the heme molecule within the hemoglobin is bound to oxygen or not bound to oxygen. Now, in the case of hemoglobin and myoglobin, there are other types of molecules that can bind to this binding site, this heme binding site. One of them in particular that's very well known is carbon monoxide. Now, carbon monoxide is poisonous. Why is it poisonous? It has to do all related to its KD, its dissociation constant. So carbon monoxide can also fit the same binding site and it binds heme. Now I'm just talking about the heme molecule, 20,000 times better than oxygen. That means that its KD is very, 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 very low, right? It binds to carbon monoxide strongly. And this has to do with the actual electronic structure of carbon monoxide. It's because that it has a lone pair that can be donated from its D orbitals straight to the iron D orbitals. Now, when heme is inside of a protein, that's in the case of myoglobin and hemoglobin, so not just by itself, but inside of a protein, it actually helps to decrease the affinity for a carbon monoxide. This is good for us. That means that when heme is inside of a protein, carbon monoxide doesn't have a strength of 20,000 times that of oxygen, but it still binds about 250 times better than oxygen. So it is still very dangerous because it is so, it has such a high affinity for heme when it's in hemoglobin and when it's in myoglobin, 250 times better than oxygen. That means that if you have any carbon monoxide around, it's going to outcompete that oxygen. It binds so strongly, even at very, very low concentrations to your hemoglobin. And because it competes with oxygen, it thus blocks the ability of myoglobin or hemoglobin to actually bind what we need, which is the oxygen, which will not allow us to have um, mitochondrial function or oxidative phosphorylation and essentially kills the cells, kills the biological unit. And that is why carbon monoxide is extremely toxic and poisonous because even a small amount of it has such a low KD, such a low dissociation constant that it outcompetes oxygen. Now you can see the actual positioning of oxygen versus carbon monoxide. Oxygen molecules usually bind on this side on whereas the carbon monoxide binds linearly to heme. Now, the reason that heme inside of hemoglobin or inside of myoglobin is not as strongly binding to carbon monoxide, so it's actually a little bit weaker binding, is because when heme is inside the protein, it actually forces this carbon monoxide to tilt, just like the oxygen. And that makes it not bind as well. Carbon monoxide, when it binds to iron like this and heme likes to be linear. Here's another um, image of, this is heme in, inside of the protein. These are, these are just kind of like the side amino acids that happen to be around the protein. So we've kind of zoomed in, we're looking at just the area where heme is bound to the protein. So remember that the rest of the protein chain is still there, it's just kind of made invisible. But you can see this is again, just a close up view. Here's the oxygen. It's coordinated by a histidine here. And here's the iron in the heme that it's binding to. And here's the other histidine that kind of binds that iron from the other side. These are the main amino acids 
we call this the proximal histidine and the distal histidine that are involved in stabilization of heme and the binding of oxygen in myoglobin and hemoglobin. Okay, so I'm going to pose a question uh, in talking about myoglobin and hemoglobin. And this is back in relation to our Hill plot. And again, thinking about dissociation constants. The pressure of oxygen in our lungs is much higher as you would imagine. There's more oxygen in the lungs in general. So for something like myoglobin, and again, here's its Hill plot and I've actually marked out points for you. When the pressure of oxygen is at 13 kilopascals, that's actually even off the side of this plot, way up here, you can see that all of the myoglobin protein, all fractions of it are bound to oxygen. So that's awesome. The pressure in our lungs is so high that all of the myoglobin has oxygen bound to it. That's exactly what we want. Now let's compare that to the pressure of oxygen in the tissue or the concentration of oxygen that's in the surrounding tissue. And I've marked it here in red. It's about four kilopascals. That's the concentration or the pressure of the oxygen in tissue. Now let's look at what concentration of myoglobin is bound at that point. It's still about 100%, a fraction of one, 100%. That means all of the myoglobin is still bound to oxygen, even when it's not in the lungs anymore, it's in your tissue. So that means it won't release the oxygen. But in a system, in a biological system, we need a protein that actually is going to bind oxygen really well and really tightly when it's in the lungs. But then when it gets to the tissue, it needs to be able to let go of the oxygen and release it. So would, in the case of myoglobin, lowering its affinity, lowering its P50, the pressure at which 50% of it is bound, would lowering that help in this case? We can imagine a type of line. So here, instead of the P50 being this very, 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 very low amount of pressure, what if we made it like this. So now the point at which half of the half of the um, myoglobin is bound to oxygen is at this pressure that is at this higher pressure. So at this point you can see, okay, well, when we're in the tissue, that's good because now the myoglobin will release the oxygen. Only about half of it will be bound to oxygen. But the problem in this case is when we're in the lungs, when we need it to bind oxygen, you're now still too low. It's not binding efficiently at 